to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. And we're going to start this episode out with a disclaimer. We are going to be talking about some pretty hefty subjects here. So trigger warning, we're going to get into some discussion around child abuse, sexual assault, other criminal actions that sometimes we as Air Force officers are exposed to, especially if you go into the career field of the Office of Special Investigations. Yep. Thanks for that, Colin. I thought Captain Steed did a really good job, but we want to make sure that, you know, for those in the audience, maybe listening with kids or who have suffered, you know, traumatic experiences, bottom line, audience beware, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we don't get into any detail around those kinds of things, but know that it is something that we discuss. So we want to make you aware of that. That all said, this is a fantastic episode. Great discussion here with Captain Jason Steed, who is a 71 Sierra, Office of Special Investigations. He is a special investigator. That is his career field. When we did the interview, he was an instructor for Air Force ROTC, so not currently utilizing the badge, but definitely a great discussion around this really important career field that officers can go into. Absolutely. And one, Colin, I don't think a whole lot of people know about or know a whole lot about. So I think it's high time we turn it over to the interview. Absolutely. All right. Captain Jason Steed, welcome to the show. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you here. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited about this one for a variety of reasons. But first and foremost, I want to say thank you for taking the time to not only meet with me and agree to the interview, but you reached out to me and said that you wanted to come on the show and talk about your career field. And I'm just interested to hear from you. What was the motivation? Why did you feel that there was a need for you to come on to the Air Force Officer podcast to talk about the Office of Special Investigations? Yeah, absolutely. So great question. So first off, I like you and Reed, I'm a huge Air Force nerd. I absolutely love the Air Force. I'm an Air Force ROTC instructor right now. Oh, cool. And so many of my students, but also students when I go like TDY to field training to as an instructor, or I do debt assessments, like inspecting other detachments. Okay. Part of that is talking to cadets and seeing about that. And a lot of students are interested in, hey, what is OSI? How do I apply? How do I do this? I've had the privilege of sort of mentoring a few cadets into the command. And by the command, I mean OSI. But what I realize is that there's a knowledge gap out there sure. for a lot of prospective officers who are interested in becoming 71S or OSI special agents as their AFSC. So I saw, hey, you all have some awesome content, you know, with uh, pilots and RPAs and uh, JAGs and all sorts of other career fields. Didn't see OSI on the list, so I figured I'd reach out. You're right. You are the first to reach the topic of OSI, and we have not had this interview yet. And thankfully, I have not had a whole lot of reason to interface with OSI. I have, though, command-directed in investigation before, so there has been a little bit. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I am pretty uninformed when it comes to OSI, what special agents do, why the career field exists. And so this is going to be instructive for me at a baseline, but hopefully the audience is going to find some value in it too. So before we get into your career field, let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit more, give us an idea of where you're from, your background, your upbringing, what led you to the Air Force, how you earned your commission, that sort of thing. And we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. So I grew up in Colorado. I'm a mountain kid at heart. I think you're in Utah. I'm not far I am, from... but I'm from uh, Colorado. Grew... Where at? I'm from Fort Collins. Okay. All right. So I grew up in like the Steamboat Springs area. Okay. Very cool. 
So, but love Fort Collins. See, uh, I knew I liked you. Yeah. I went to school. Well, you might not here in a second. Uh, <laughs> oh, I went no. to school at the University of Wyoming, which is a big, oh. yeah, big, oh, and that's. Okay. Actually, I really don't care. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> never was a CSU fan. Never really cared about UW and in the, in the whole rivalry there. I think it's more entertaining than yep. anything. And so I've got nothing against you there. All right. Cool. Good. Yeah. So. Went to college at the University of Wyoming, mostly because it was cheaper than CSU or CU. Right. And there may have been like a young lady that I followed there thinking, you know, this could work out. All right. But she encouraged me to, as, as I'm looking around and seeing these ROTC cadets on campus, she was like, hey, you know, you did this Civil Air Patrol thing for like six years in high school and whatnot. Yeah. And you're kind of an Air Force nerd already. <laughs> you should probably go check out ROTC. So you did do CAP. You were in Civil Air Patrol. I was, yeah. And okay. that's something that I kept kind of quiet when I started ROTC, just because, you know, you get some folks who come into any program with a little bit of similar experience, and they're sure. like, oh, I know everything, when, you know, maybe you don't. So, but I did do Civil Air Patrol. I had some fantastic mentors in Civil Air Patrol. Many of them happened to be military officers. So either reservists or active duty, kind of doing it as a side thing. So... That was kind of what got me a little bit involved. Okay. And so in college, I thought, hey, let me give this a try. Because of my CAP experience, I was able to earn a scholarship pretty quickly. The detachment commander had some to give out. I was brand new to the program, but I do credit my CAP experience with kind of giving me the ability to speak respectfully and kind of engage at that level where the commander took a chance on me, been in the program for a week and gave me an in-college scholarship. Wow. So very, very fortunate there. Yeah, you were very <laughs> lucky or very impressive or a combination of both. I think lucky. I think most of my so-called achievements, and I'm doing air quotes for the listeners, but would be mostly just timing and luck yeah. and less about me. Which is kind of foreshadowing to everything that comes later in the Air Force career. Potentially, yep. Timing and luck. It just sometimes that's just how it goes, right? Yep. You just got to be in the right place at the right time and do well where you are, you know. Any good opportunity doesn't open doors for folks who, sure. who are not kind of blooming where they are planted. But yeah, so did ROTC. Commissioned initially when I was a junior, I got an RPA slot to be a remotely piloted aircraft pilot. Okay. Didn't super want to do that. I was still planning on applying for OSI to be an OSI agent at 71S. However, you know, got this RPA slot, was going to go full steam ahead with that until I heard otherwise, went to my flight physical had some vision things and they said, Hey, you can't do this. Okay, great. Okay. So that next summer I went and applied to be an OSI agent. I went to the OSI detachment at FE Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, which would later be one of my OSI homes. Interviewed with the detachment commander, shadowed some agents, got some perspective on the job, which was very, very helpful because it helped me to decide and make an informed decision that this was what I wanted to do professionally. So for sure. Interviewed, yeah. I think did well, was not selected. Oh, so as a college student, not selected for OSI. So the person that I interviewed encouraged me, hey, do you still want this? You know, there could be an opportunity later down the road, but bloom where you are planted. So just to clarify a couple of things here. So in ROTC, you had been picked up for an RPA slot, but you got medically disqualified from that. Correct. Okay. And then, but you had already decided you wanted to pursue OSI like you had that in the back of your mind. And so you weren't too beat up over the loss of the RPA slot because you had this other thing that you were chasing, but ended up not being able to get that. Yes, that is correct. Okay, so you know, kind of like a one-two punch here. How are you feeling at this point in your fledgling ROTC Air Force career about not getting the things that you want right out the gate? You know, there were a couple of moments where I allowed myself to sort of feel sorry for myself. And then I realized that I needed to move on because that wasn't going to do anybody any good. Right. So pick myself up, you know, the RPA thing that was going to be cool. OSI I thought was going to be cool as well. Then I got picked up. My eventual AFSC that I was selected for was to be a missileer. Okay. The 13N space and missiles. 13N space and missiles. They had just kind of had the space and missiles split. So I knew that space was not an option. Okay. So it was going to be missiles, which was kind of okay with me, right? A lot of people say, oh, you got missiles, sorry. Yeah. But most of those folks are sort of uninformed about what the AFSC is and what the opportunities are. So I commissioned in May of 2013, went out to Vandenberg, 
for my initial skills training as a missileer. About halfway, three quarters of the way through training, I got sick, got meningitis, and then had uh, some heart issues. So had to have heart surgery. Uh, and eventually I was told, you may no longer be a missileer. So I'm wow. <laughs> okay. So another punch to the gut. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah. Which led to me needing to find a different job in the Air Force. I was very fortunate to be able to stay in the Air Force, had some good doctors, some folks that were sort of on my side, like, hey, this guy is medically okay to be in the Air Force, but not medically okay to be a missileer, which was fine. I just figured new adventure time. So over the course of the next almost year, I worked as kind of like a first year instructor, follow on instructor pilot type of a person where I was working in the missile schoolhouse, developing training curriculum, things like that. Yeah. While I was waiting for a new job, the board for reclasses for IST initial skills training eliminates, you know, so folks who don't make it through pilot training or whatever their initial skills training, it happened to have OSI on it at that point. Oh, really? Okay. And I had been doing some work with the SARC office there as a volunteer victim advocate which I know you had a Sark on an earlier episode and she talked about volunteer victim advocates. Yep. Great program, tough work, but very important work in the Air Force. And so because of that, I kind of knew some of the OSI folks. So I again said, hey, I threw my hat in the ring for OSI, interviewed again and went through the process again and was fortunate enough to be selected. So again, this is me you know, saying it was more about timing and less about me because OSI was not on the board prior to mine, and it mm. wasn't on the board following mine. So just the good timing in the Air Force. That's so interesting. You can totally see how sometimes the timing, the luck, the opportunities just are not there. They're not in your favor. But when they are, they are. you have to be prepared. Correct. Because sometimes the pitch is going to come your way, and you better be ready to swing, right? Right. But sometimes the pitch is not going to come at all, and you have to be okay with that, man. Just that brief 10 minute description of your background leading into OSI. I mean, that is years worth of experience that I hope that our audience is able to grab onto and really sink their teeth into it, have it become part of themselves, because that's what the Air Force is for, especially for officers, is that sometimes you just aren't going to get your way, but sometimes you will. Yep, absolutely. And just being open to opportunities you know, doing well wherever you are, because I would not have been selected for OSI if I had just kind of sat around and been the snack bar lieutenant yep. for a year, right? So I kept busy. I contributed beyond, you know, my little three foot bubble. And I think that was what led me to being a somewhat competitive candidate. That's so fascinating. I do want to go back just a little bit, though, if you don't mind, to while you were at University of Wyoming, you didn't mention what you were studying. And also, does it even matter to get into OSI? And then we'll start getting into OSI itself from there. So I was studying criminal justice. Okay. I kind of had always thought I wanted to be in law enforcement of some sort. So I thought, hey, criminal justice, that sounds good. Plus, I'm not a math guy or a science type of guy. I can do it. But, you know, stats classes are like the end of my math sort of experience. So yeah, studying criminal justice, interned with a police department and decided, hey, yes, I do want to do this. But it doesn't necessarily matter in our applicants okay. whether they are enlisted, because we have enlisted agents, we have officer agents, and we have civilian GS, you know, Department of the Air Force employees, but they're not military members. So we have enlisted officer and civilian agents. And really, the educational background doesn't matter. For our officers, we just want them to have an education and be critical thinkers, Okay, which is what they're looking for. Most non-technical AFSCs are looking for critical thinkers. Yeah. So let's use that to jump into the actual application process. How does one you know, first make known the fact that they want to become an OSI special agent and then lead us through the process of the interviews, the, the screening, all the wickets that people have to go through in order to get selected? Yeah, so I'm going to speak mostly for officers. However, I have recruited several enlisted agents into the command, so I can also answer some questions there. But let's say you're a ROTC student or an academy student at the Air Force Academy. Why not OTS? It's just a little bit of a different process. Okay. And it's done sort of before you go to OTS, not in the middle of the program. Okay, so maybe we address those separately. Right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So regardless, you need to start for ROTC in the academy, kind of being serious about it. In the junior year okay. or the third year, the AS 300 year, you need a little bit of time. Applications are due, generally speaking, in August 
before someone graduates, right? So if you graduate in May of 2021, applications would have been due in August of 2020. And the application process involves a few things. It involves certainly an application with a resume, three letters of recommendation, one of which needs to be from your ROTC detachment commander, or if you're at the Air Force Academy, the air officer commanding, okay. right? So letter of recommendation from the top person in your unit. And so unit commander has an opportunity to provide comments, right? Hey, this is my number X of XX number of applicants. Yeah. The cadets ranking within ROTC, because unfortunately cadets have to be ranked, you know, one to N. Yeah. Stratifications. Yep, yep. Absolutely. And that's the way the Air Force goes. So we're looking for folks that are on the higher side of stratification, right? The lower number, ideally number one, number two. Stratus applicants from the same detachment are stratified against each other. Right. So if you had two applicants applying from your ROTC detachment, one of you is going to be the number one recommendation from the commander and one of you has to be the number two. Right. Other recommended content is like, hey, any awards that you've earned in ROTC, scholarships, any other things that you've done special. Academic awards, GPA. Academic awards, GPA, the lot. Yeah, okay. absolutely. They're looking for kind of a little bit of everything. The whole person, whole airman, whole officer concept. Yep. Whole person, whole airman, whole officer concept, whole perspective officer concept, you know, for folks who are proactive. So just waiting for this application to come out and asking your cadre might work, but I would suggest to anybody listening who is interested in joining OSI as an officer agent, get a hold of an OSI detachment near you and say, hey, look, I'm an ROTC cadet, I'm an Air Force Academy cadet, and I'm interested in learning more about this career field. Because a part of the application process is also going and interviewing with an OSI detachment leader, right? So a special agent in charge or a detachment commander must do an interview. And I would say that most folks who interview well with OSI are not new to that office, right? They've asked to go in shadow for a few days and they, you know, so they're not walking in off the street and saying, hey, interview me because I need this piece of paper filled out. They're saying, hey, remember me? I spent three days here learning about your mission, yeah. being involved. And by the way, I would really love to do this. Is there any chance we could sit down for an interview? Right. That sounds a lot better than, you know, fill this paper out. I need it. Right. We definitely recommend that folks... And we being either ROTC cadre or OSI leadership recommends that folks get familiar with the realities of the profession, understand what an OSI agent does, and also understand what it means to be an OSI officer, which is like any officer, you're not going to be spending a 20-year career running investigations, right? They expect you to be a leader. Sure. So that's kind of a little bit basic about the process. There's some other requirements. There's some cognitive tests and some other things, but three out letters of recommendation an interview cover letter that you have to sort of learn how to write. A lot of it hinges on the interview with the OSI detachment commander. Yeah. So I actually want to talk about the interview a little bit more because I actually think that's pretty unique as far as like how officer AFSC career field selection goes. I got selected into civil engineering without ever having to do an interview, right? Nobody asked me if I was interested. I never told anyone that I was interested. In fact, I didn't even know that civil engineering was a thing before I got picked for it, right? And that's actually more common than not. Whereas the OSI interview process is far more aligned with kind of how things go in the civilian and corporate world where you apply for a job, there is a screening interview, and then you meet with people who are going to be responsible for you. And they actually have to say, yes, this is somebody that we want, where that's not the case for the vast majority of the rest of the Air Force, especially for officers. And so I wanted to get your take on that. Is this a good thing? Should it be implemented elsewhere? What would be the pros and cons of doing an interview process in order to get the right people into the right career fields? Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. So I think it's a good thing for certain career fields. Okay. For OSI, I think it's a really good, a really good thing because we need folks who have demonstrated maturity, uh, strong leadership qualities. Right, All 71S officers, which is the OSI FSC, are expected to be sort of informal and formal leaders in their OSI career. So being assessed at an early stage is important, I think, to that. And so that's important. I think for every other AFSC, it would depend on if they have the capacity to do that and also what the career progression looks like for that AFSC, right? It's not uncommon, though, to have an OSI detachment commander who is a third or maybe fourth assignment 03, 04 
who is the commander of an OSI detachment and, you know, responsible for all OSI activities on a base. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we get the right folks into those jobs, right? Folks who are in it not to be agents, but to do the work. Yeah. And folks who are in it to serve, but also have the maturity to interact with a wing commander from day one. Yeah. To interact with a, a numbered Air Force commander or higher, you know, from kind of day one. So I think other AFSCs could benefit from it as well. Certainly AFSCs that involve a lot of strong leadership right out the gate. And you go through this interview process so that you can suss that type of thing out. And I'm curious, what is it that kind of signals this person is what we're looking for when you say to that formal and informal leadership, that preparedness to interface with an 06 and 07, 08 or above, you know, from day one, what is it that you are looking for to say, yes, this is the person that we want? Yeah, good question. I think it's a little bit of can folks speak to, you know, intelligently, a little bit of a high pressure situation, which for many, it's that interview, right? It's kind of high pressure. It's the job that they might want. Do they dress for the job that they want, right? Do they show up in jeans and a t-shirt or do they wear a suit? Because that's what you're expected to wear as an agent, you know, if you're going to testify in court. Some of it's looking the part, some of it's acting the part. You know, it's not a completely subjective interview. There is a form that the OSI detachment leadership fills out and provides the recommendation, hey, you know, is this person, did they speak well? Or can we sit down and have a conversation? Because at the end of the day, that leadership is looking for somebody that they would trust to run their detachment in their stead, should they be gone, right? Yeah. Um, and probably that applicant's not coming back to that detachment, but generally speaking, right, they want somebody who has those qualities. At its core, what OSI does is talk to people and write things down, right? Whether it's for a criminal investigation or a fraud investigation or a counterintelligence investigation or operation, you know, we're fact finders and we talk to people. We need to be able to sit down and have conversations with folk, build rapport, kind of have some banter, sort of like you and I did at the beginning of this interview before we even started, right? Are Just, you interviewing me for OSI right now? Am I? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know. No. You know, so I'm not with the command right now. I'm teaching Air Force ROTC and having a blast doing it. Yeah. So you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> so literally not today, OSI, right? Literally not today, OSI. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So thanks for letting me dive a little bit more into that because I have found that to be a very interesting process to get somebody uh, into selected and prepared for going into a career field. And obviously it seems to be working out pretty well. The OSI career field doesn't seem to be hurting for numbers on a regular basis, but sometimes you know spots open up and like we were talking about earlier, there's the opportunity for somebody to come in and demonstrate that they can look, speak, and act the part of a OSI agent. Yep, absolutely. So by the numbers, you know, this year, I think it was 12 selects from ROTC. Okay. And I think another five or eight, I'm not 100% certain, from the academy. But there may have been hundreds of applicants. Sure. You know, so all of your entire package, the detachment commander recommendation or non-recommendation, this writing sample, an applicant questionnaire, and the rest of your package goes up to a board of seasoned veteran OSI agents who look at the whole person concept, look at the recommendation of the detachment commander, look at your letters of recommendation, and make a call from there. So it's a tough career field to get into. Yeah. But I may be biased, but I think it's the best AFSC in the Air Force. <laughs> Maybe a close second would be teaching ROTC, but that's not a, a real primary AFSC. Unfortunately. But, you know, it's also a good thing that we get out there and get some real operational experience before we bequeath our knowledge to the cadets, right? Oh, for sure. Okay, good. So let's talk about the career field itself. 71S, Office of Special Investigations, Special Agent. What do they call you? You are a special agent regardless of your rank and whether you're an officer or, or enlisted or apparently and also civilian. Yep, correct. So our uh, agents are, are called special agents if they're filling the criminal investigator position. So whether they're enlisted, officer or civilian, our enlisted agents have to have had a different AFSC first. Okay. So they cannot be direct accessions. Some folks come from security forces. Others come from medical. Doesn't really matter your background, you know, as long as you can articulate why you'd be a good agent. Very similar process. But yeah, they call a special agent. And the reason for that is not so, you know, folks can sound cool. It does sound cool, though, by the way. It can. You know, for the first few minutes, it does. Um, <laughs> and then again, you know, you humble yourself and realize this is not about me. It's about the process. But sure. So why that is, why, right? We call it rank masking. And the reason for that is, is if I, as a captain, 
am interviewing a brand new airman to the Air Force. That airman has just left basic training, tech school, hasn't interacted with a lot of officers. Yeah. So if they're in my interview room as a witness, as a subject, as a victim, whatever, we don't want rank to be a factor there, sure. right? We don't want them to say, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. We want them to just be able to have a conversation with us and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. If we have a staff sergeant agent who is 100% qualified as a special agent interviewing a colonel or a general, which happens, we don't want that colonel or general to be looking at the rank in the room, right? Which may happen, especially if they get on the defense or, or however they're feeling, right? But right. we want them to focus on why they're there and the content of the interview. So that's the basic reason behind rank masking, right? It's not to be secretive and it's not to be super cool. It's literally to just help enable us to do our jobs. Yeah, that is really interesting. So you don't wear a rank for the most part. You mentioned earlier that earlier that the primary reason for your job and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis is talking to those people, those brand new airmen, those colonels, those generals, depending on what the situation is, trying to find the facts. What sort of facts and what sort of conversations are you looking to have? What do you fill your day with? Yeah, so let's break it down to OSI's three main you know, lines of effort or focus, right? So you've got criminal investigations, and those are kind of felony level criminal investigations. So any sort of death case involving somebody in the Air Force or there being an Air Force nexus or connection, criminal investigations, counterintelligence, investigations and operations, and then fraud all at the felony level for fraud as well. So we're not talking like okay. government travel card fraud. It's more like, you know, program level F-35 program fraud, right? Hey, we said that we were going to get brand new parts and we got recycled parts, something like that. So there's no one typical, you know, day in OSI, just like any, any Air Force career. Sure. No day looks the same, but it involves a lot of talking to people, you know, bringing folks in for interview, figuring out where your investigations need to go next what the process needs to look like, meeting with key stakeholders, so customers, JAGs, commanders, things like that, meeting with other law enforcement. So whether it's local law enforcement, you know, if you're in Omaha, Nebraska, you're going to meet with the Omaha police, yeah, but also the FBI and the DEA and other federal partners. Okay. So there's an external component to this where you have to be able to interface with agencies outside of the Air Force. There is absolutely. Yeah. Liaison is huge to OSI because we do a lot by ourselves, right? But we work so much better with our partners, our local and our federal partners. So any investigation, any operation that OSI does, it has to have a nexus or a connection to the Air Force. So, you know, we don't go after, say, drug dealers downtown Omaha, right? Unless we can prove that there's a nexus, you know, they're dealing and recruiting dealers that are happen to be Air Force Airmen, right? And then we're gonna work with our partners. We're gonna focus on the military folks and they're gonna focus on the civilian folks, but our jurisdiction, if you will, doesn't end at the gate and doesn't end at the Air Force property. Okay. So it, it lies more with the person. So the person being a somebody who is subject to the code, right? The UCMJ. Yeah. Most of our criminal investigations involve the UCMJ articles, which happen to be Title 10 of the United States Code. And then our counterintelligence activities involve countering the intelligence activities of other organizations or governments from a, a few different perspectives. And then our fraud, we interact a lot with civilian companies, you know, Boeing, Raytheon, those types of companies and their subcontractors and things like that to make sure that the taxpayer's dollar is being used effectively and in a manner consistent with contracts and things like that. Okay, very good. So let me just make sure I got all of that. You're responsible for investigating any sort of Air Force connection to crime, counterintelligence, fraud, and liaising with the outside agencies in order to further the investigation on those types of things. Did I miss anything? I'm sure there's a bunch of things that you know I could have said, but no, that's pretty much it, right? We are the federal law enforcement agency for the Department of the Air Force. And I say the Department of the Air Force because we are now the servicing agency for the Space Force, sure. which is exciting. Yep. You know, there will not be a Space Force Office of Investigations. The Secretary of the Air Force designated one Inspector General, which is who OSI works for, is the Inspector General. Okay. So one Inspector General, one Military Criminal Investigative Organization. That's what we are as an MCIO. Other MCIOs that folks may have heard of, there's Army CID, 
And then there's this one that the Navy has. They've got like one or two or six TV shows, NCIS, yeah. right? So I was going to say. <laughs> so that's the one that most folks have heard of. And that's the easiest way to contextualize in 10 seconds what we do. Yeah. It's like NCIS, but for the Air Force. Right. And fewer commercial breaks and you yeah. know, those sorts of things. <laughs> Okay, and so you are doing those things as an officer, you're you're doing these investigations, potentially working hand in hand with enlisted or civilian special agents who are doing exactly the same work, but at the same time, you are still an officer, right? And so you fall under the same requirements as officers in other career fields, and there is a career progression to that. What is the career progression, the developmental path for the officer special agent? Yep. Good question. So first thing, most of our officers are direct accessions, right? So I was not, but most are, and they come in and they spend, you know, one tour, maybe two at the field level, investigating things and, you know, doing sort of agent stuff. Then they move on, you know, either to a staff job at our headquarters or a staff job at, at our regions. And our regions are aligned with the air forces and I guess the space force equivalent of major commands. Okay. And so either at headquarters or the regions, or the MAGCOMs, you know, that, or folks can specialize as officers and go into things like forensics, or go to the Defense Language Institute and become a linguist and do that sort of work. But all paths eventually lead to leadership or at a detachment level or at the region level. So pretty quickly, folks are going to be leaders of some sort. You know, lieutenants, going to be at a debt, first lieutenant, probably going to be uh, moving up to a region. And then, you know, either specializing or going back into the field. Other specialties, we have uh, fraud. Like I said, we've got the Office of Special Projects, which supports SAP programs. We have counterintelligence specialties, protective service operations. So protecting, you know, the Secretary of the Air Force. Oh, interesting. The staff, foreign dignitaries. Okay. And then a part of that, obviously, you are... Uh, in ROTC. And so that's not precluded out of the officer special agent developmental path. There's opportunity for you to come outside of your career field, do some career broadening kind of stuff. What does that all kind of look like? Yeah. So we call those out of command opportunities. So it's either, you know, going and teaching ROTC or the academy, teaching somewhere else or working, you know, just a different job in the Air Force, a staff job at the Pentagon, things like that, doing other things. So for captains, it's mostly the ROTC, the officer instructor and recruiter special duty, which just like anybody else, now an officer would have to apply to. I came to teach ROTC through a different pathway. So I, like you, separated from active duty Air Force, went into the reserves for about six months, <laughs> got picked up for the VILPAD program to go and teach specifically ROTC, which has a shelf life, as you know, right? Yeah. And then going to head back to the reserves and move on from there. But yeah, that definitely opportunities to get outside of the career field, career broaden. We encourage folks to do that. It's competitive to be able to do that sure. because OSI wants to send its best and brightest out and they want to get their best and brightest back from those assignments better and brighter, which I think you do from assignments like ROTC right. or teaching at the academy or doing other career broadening things. For sure. I absolutely agree with that. The time spent in ROTC is uh, certainly a highlight of my career. I think when you find yourself in a position responsible for the growth and development of other people, you can't help but become better yourselves. So yeah, whether you're in OSI or any other career field, if you see the opportunity to teach ROTC or OTS or go to the academy, find yourself in some sort of instructing type of opportunity you know, through the OIRSD, would highly recommend that people give it some serious consideration. 100%. Yeah. I think you learn leadership at a, just a different level, leading not only yourself in those positions, but leading trainees and officer, you know, prospective officers, folks who want to be like you or like your peers, right? So really, really great opportunity and a lot of fun too. Very busy, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. So back on the topic of career development, career progression. So you're going to get opportunities to lead pretty quickly. But on the more specifically on the topic of like rank potential, I don't know. So I'm asking the question, does OSI have like its own one, two or three star that's over the whole career field or is the IG for the Air Force or how does that work? Yeah, good question. So I don't believe the IG hasn't typically had an OSI background. I know General Saeed does not have an OSI background. OSI has a one star 
who is in okay. charge of the organization. So, so one star at the top, our regions, one through eight are all headed by at 06. Okay. Deputy commander below that person at the regions. And then your detachment commanders fall underneath the regions, either as majors, captains, or lieutenant colonels, depending on the size of the detachment. One general. So if folks are looking to be a general, pretty slim pickings up towards the top. Sure. And then on the civilian side, we have, you know, an executive director who is kind of like the number two. Okay. Uh, there's also a vice commander for OSI who is an OSI 06. So the headquarters staff, there's folks at the SES level, right? That's the executive director. And then other SES type folks, senior executive service type civilian folks in civilian leadership within the organization. Okay. And obviously you can correct me if I'm wrong and you know, there are bad apples in, in every organization, but I have to assume that the kind of people that are attracted to working in OSI are probably not the same people who are chasing rank and position. That's not really your primary motivation. And so you're not going to get very many people coming into OSI who are gunning for that one star position. No, I, that's not been my experience. Most of the officers that I've worked with are just, they want to do a good job, right? They're there to serve. The rank is kind of just secondary, you know, whatever they happen to wear on their dress uniform when they wear their uniform, because OSI agents don't typically wear uniforms. That doesn't really matter. What matters more is their ability to lead and the opportunities that that presents to do a good job for our customers. Yeah. And that is a great segue into the question that I think you know is coming. Why are we having officers do the OSI gig? Why not have it be strictly an enlisted position? Why not have it be completely civilianized or contracted out, given to another organization? I don't want to paint the picture that officers shouldn't be special agents because the rank is secondary and sometimes kind of gets in the way of you being able to do your job, like you mentioned earlier about being able to have that honest and open conversation with a brand new airman or the colonel or the general officer, you know, staring down a captain or a staff sergeant, like you mentioned, why have that officer be part of that? Help me understand this a little bit from your perspective. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, it boils down to the same question, you know, why does it have to be an officer in the cockpit or why does it have to be an officer leading, you know, security forces or logistics, things like that? The reality is, is that with OSI, like many career fields, officers are the minority in the ranks, right? So of our three groups of agents, we have the most enlisted agents and then civilians and then officers with only a couple of hundred officers. Sure. And what I tell every person who is interested in OSI is OSI is hiring you as an officer first and an agent second. Okay. That's interesting. They're looking for you to lead creatively. They're looking for folks who can think outside the box and not be constrained by, you know, this is what I do and this is what I know and this is what I've done, but also to be responsible for leading and developing their people, which I think are traits certainly not unique to officers, right? There are some fantastic senior enlisted leaders that develop their people. But officers are trained to do that and expected to do that. They're trained to be managers of programs and leaders of people, which is what leads us to, I think, having mostly officer leadership in our detachments. And it's a leadership team, by the way, right? So it's not just one officer okay. in charge of a detachment. It's an officer and then a senior NCO, a superintendent in many detachments. So leadership team of experienced folks, or you'll have a civilian special agent in charge, but again, experienced leaders. So... To sum up your question, I think it's just sort of that they shoulder the responsibility of command and of leadership on those officers, right? So OSI, our investigations do have the tremendous burden and responsibility potentially leading to somebody's liberty being detained or providing answers for a family who is grieving or helping somebody through a hard situation or protecting the taxpayer's dollars or protecting, you know, sensitive programs within the Air Force. So our officers are expected to understand the gravity of that, look beyond the investigation, look beyond, you know, the checklist that we have to run to get things done and the oversight and truly appreciate and understand why those things are there. So more succinctly, I would say it's because of the gravity of the work we do, right? So if you look at other AFSCs, you know, flyers, for instance, somebody who's going to pull the trigger and drop a very large weapon on someone, right? Yeah. That decision calculus is not made in a vacuum. It should be made by, the Air Force has said, 
an officer who understands that responsibility and, and communicates back and forth with the appropriate agencies. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. No, thank you. And I like to often think about this in terms of what the officer corps in general is responsible for, which is to protect and defend the Constitution, right? But the Constitution is set up to protect and defend the ideals and the principles that are outlined in the Declaration of Independence, which is that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We are there to protect equality and certain unalienable rights, right? Which is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to your example about like the pilot being responsible for pulling that trigger or the people who do pull the trigger, therein is the life component, deciding whether or not somebody lives or dies. And it sounds to me like you, the OSI agent and the OSI structure as a whole is a little bit more responsible toward the liberty and the pursuit of happiness side of things. You're making decisions on whether or not somebody's going to spend some time in jail or not, right? Sort of, to a degree. We are articulating the facts and circumstances behind events, right? We don't make the decisions. That's up to judges and juries, commanders. Fair. And that. thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. But we gather the facts that enable those folks to make accurate decisions. And we don't have much of an investment either way, you know, in proving that X person did X allegation. Our interest is in finding out the truth and the facts behind the allegation. So when I'm working a criminal investigation, I will work just as hard to prove that somebody is innocent or guilty because then I know that I've turned over all the rocks and things like that. So, but the eventual outcome of our investigations on the criminal side often is the deprivation of liberty. So that is, to your point, I think the burden that the officer in charge of an organization of a detachment has to bear. Yeah. And it makes me think about the time that I spent supporting an investigation, like I mentioned at the top of the episode, that I have done a command-directed investigation that eventually led to the deprivation of liberty for an individual. And feeling the responsibility, the part that I played in that was uh, pretty intense mm -hmm. uh, to the point where like, I mean, I obviously was not doing things to the level that OSI has to deal with, thank goodness. But even so, in the days after that investigation concluded, my commander noticed that there was a very big change in my demeanor and in the way that I was carrying myself because of the knowledge that I had gained through that investigation. It really weighs on you. It does. And maybe that's something that you could speak to here as part of being not just an officer, not just a special agent, but a combination of the two. The responsibility of not only your authority, but the knowledge that you carry, how has that affected you over the course of your career? Yeah, so I think that goes hand in hand with why I wanted to come on to this show and provide that, you know, that educated decision making calculus for folks who might be interested in this career field or just who are curious about it. Yeah. Right. So we don't deal with sunshine and butterflies every day within the Air Force. Or ever. <laughs> Or ever. <laughs> but let me start off by saying that the Air Force is made up of really, really great people, sure. right? 99.99% .99 of the Air Force is generally motivated, dedicated, here to serve, our officer corps, made up of fantastic individuals that want to be a part of a team. But in our mission sets, criminal investigations, counterintelligence, and fraud, we don't deal with the folks who are motivated and dedicated and mm -hmm. part of a team, right? We deal with folks who have either made a bad decision had a bad decision that impacts them or, you know, a combination thereof. So the burdens that an OSI agent will feel are going to be the Air Force doesn't feel so lovely and happy all the time, right? And it, it sounds like you experienced that after your CDI, your command direct investigation that you ran. Yeah. You enter into the Air Force with this knowledge that, oh man, the Air Force is great. I want to be an officer. I want to make a difference. It is hard to then see yourself making that difference on the darker side of the Air Force, right? That 0.01% of the Air Force that, you know, as an agent, you'll deal with folks who use drugs, folks who commit sexual assault or have, have been the victims of a sexual assault, murder investigations, suicides, all of the things that make the Air Force, you know, not great. Sometimes you see headlines about drug rings within organizations at a missile base, or you see headlines of, you know, airmen found deceased or, you know, airmen murdered, things like that. Right. OSI is involved in that. And so carrying that around for our folks, we need to make sure that one, they can 
handle that. They're mature enough to handle that. But two, they know when to ask for help when they need to. And three, that they can separate, you know, their work and understand that that's not the entire Air Force. So yeah, just like you, every investigation that I've done, every death case that I've worked, every victim, every subject, every person I've come across on in some way, it just adds to whatever weighs upon me, right? Yeah. And whether the person has committed a crime or has been the victim of a crime or is deceased, it weighs on you, right? Because you know that, you know, that person didn't set out to have that as their outcome at the end of their process, right? So folks make mistakes, folks commit crimes, but they are still people. And you have to be able to realize and treat people with dignity and respect, no matter where they are, and not become jaded. Yeah. So it's very easy in any law enforcement career to become jaded. Absolutely. And therein gets back to what I talked about in our very first episode, where I talk about that an officer needs to have that well of fortitude that not only they, but others around them can draw upon in order to find that resiliency that's needed to bounce back from the dark days and events that do happen in the Air Force. That unfortunately, not every day is filled with sunshine and rainbows and butterflies, like you mentioned. Sometimes bad people make bad choices. That is going to happen. But not only that, those bad people will also influence good people to make bad choices. And that's really hard to see sometimes. Yeah, we know the bad people, they're out there, they're going to make those terrible decisions. But you as an officer who trusted this airman who you knew was a good person, but somehow got sucked in to making these really bad choices, that can really weigh you down and make you question, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Does any of this even matter? Exactly like you said, it's really hard to not let yourself get jaded in those kinds of situations. And therein is why we as officers need to be that well of fortitude for ourselves and for the people around us. Yep, I completely agree. You know, and in OSI, it's like being a mailman. It just keeps coming. Every day, there's going to be a new case or, you know, something new to do. And it feels like the mail just keeps coming and you've still got to go out and deliver. You still got to do your job. Yeah. One thing I'm very proud about my organization, OSI, and not an agent right now, but I identify as an OSI agent at my core. Sure. They take care of our agents, of pro staff, our analysts very well right? There's a, an employee assistance program. There are psychologists dedicated to OSI. We're getting the first chaplain dedicated to OSI because these things weigh on folks, right? Yeah. They, and they weigh on folks regardless of your pay structure, enlisted civilian officer. But it's expected that our officers recognize when folks are having that weight put upon their shoulders too much and say, hey, here's how we can help you out so that you can do your job effectively, right? You cannot pour from an empty vessel. So you must recharge in whatever way you need to. So here are your resources. Here's what I've been through, right? A lot of that is just is sort of saying, hey, you know, what? this is a tough job. And it's been tough on me. At times, I've asked for help. And it's worked out well for me, right? Whatever that is, you know, you've got to be able to shoulder those things, but also realize that you're not alone in doing it. So OSI takes care of its people really, really well so that those people can take care of the department. Sure. Absolutely. Love the discussion there. It does feel very weighty. You know, there's a lot of gravity associated with that. So let's not end there. Let's, you know, find a pick me up. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind, obviously you wouldn't want to share all of the terrible stuff that you've seen anyway. So let's go the other direction. Share with us a highlight from your time in the Air Force where you just found yourself like pinching yourself. Like, I can't believe that I am being paid to do this right now. What comes to your mind with something like that? So Two things. One was being probably 10 feet from President Obama. That was pretty cool. That is cool. OSI was, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, we have our protectees in our protective service mission. Mm -hmm. Secretary of the Air Force, Chief of Staff, combatant commanders, some of them we take responsibility for, others, the other MCIOs take responsibility for. But when you get our protectee near the president, both teams are going to be there. So a graduation at the Air Force Academy I went TDY and I was able to sort of function as a liaison between the Secret Service and OSI because we had two teams on the ground with the secretary and the chief. Yeah. So, you know, I was standing in the tunnel at the Air Force Academy on the Academy's football field and the president's limo pulled in and he gets out. He was really tall, by the way. He is tall. Yeah. I am not. <laughs> but that was just one of those opportunities where I was like, wow, how am I here? Yeah. How am I armed? 
this close to the president and I'm trusted to do this because, you know, the Air Force has said they trust me, right? Yeah. And then later on, the Secret Service agent that I was partnered with said, hey, can we go up to the roof of the of the press box for the air show? And I said, well, you're Secret Service. You can do whatever you want, right? <laughs> and so we went and we watched the air show from the roof of the press box. And that was a really, really cool opportunity. But I will say that for every like minute that you do those cool things yeah. within OSI or within the Air Force in general, right? You're spending a lot more minutes behind a computer typing up how you did it, why you did it, where you did it, yeah. how it went, right? There was a lot of planning that led up to that moment, a lot of work by many, many, many dedicated individuals. So that was number one. And then the first time that I was kind of just amazed that I was getting paid to do this was really at the OSI tech school. Regardless of whether you're an officer or an enlisted or a civilian, you go to the same tech school, go to the same basic training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia, where like 90 some federal agencies train. Okay, cool. Both their uniform and their criminal investigator folks. So pretty much every federal agency you can think of that is not the FBI or the DEA, and then like 80 others that you've never even heard of train at FLETC. So it's a two-part course. There's the criminal investigators training program, which is like Fed Agent 101, right? But it's like college with guns. So you'll go from a law class, <laughs> you know, a class on the constitutional law to a class on surveillance. And then that night you follow actors that they have hired around real towns in Georgia, like off the base and have to gather information about what they're doing and then write it up in a report. So that was really, really unique, really, really awesome training. And then the next day you do another, you know, you're in constitutional law and then you go to the shooting range for two hours. And then you go to lunch and then you go and get your rear end kicked at officer response tactics to make sure that you can effectively <laughs> effect an arrest if need be. So college with guns, awesome. You roll out of CITP, the Criminal Investigators Training Program, and you take all of that into the OSI specific, the agency specific follow on, where you learn how to apply everything you had just learned in CITP to the Air Force, to the UCMJ, and how we do it, you know, within our systems and things like that. So that's the whole thing about five months, six months, depending on, you know, holiday breaks and things like that, but really, really fantastic world-class training. That was a really cool opportunity to get and just to work alongside and have the same exact training as our enlisted agents and the same exact training as our civilian agents is, I think, something that's unique to this career field that not every career field experiences as well. For sure. No, that's super fascinating and definitely a great way to end this episode on a high note. Everybody's got this idea in their head here of college with guns, <laughs> how their college experience could have been that much better <laughs> with two hour range sessions. <laughs> right. Every day. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. Well, great. Jason, thank you so much for taking us through that all. There's obviously so much more that we didn't get into that I'm sure that our audience would be very interested to hear about. So we'll leave the door open for you to come back another time to revisit some of these topics again. But if they can't wait for that, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you to ask about the application process, day in the life of OSI agent, opportunities for being stationed around the world or whatever? How do people get in touch with you? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the best way to get a hold of me, just because I'm going to be leaving my current position soon, uh, teaching ROTC would be to reach out to me through the Air Force Officer podcast. And I'd be glad to provide my perspective. But I also encourage folks to get a hold of their local OSI detachment, get the perspective of the folks there, hear about the job from a few different folks. Yeah. And filter out the opinion from what is important to you, whatever that is. But I look forward to answering any questions anybody has. Yeah. So in reaching out to you, investigating the OSI career field, they should act like an investigator <laughs> and find the facts. Yep, absolutely. They should talk to people. Talk to people, find the facts. Yeah, I know, right? That's what we're looking <laughs> for, right? So go out and see, show us what you could do, I guess, would be the takeaway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe not a two hour range session. That's not what they're looking for, but probably not. That's not the everyday, but the everyday is talking to people, you know, writing things down, having conversations, being a person, just showing that you care about whatever it is that you do, right? Officership in general, you know, we're looking for folks who want to be officers. Officership in general is taking what you do seriously, but not yourself. Yeah. So on that note, you know, the question's coming. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. That's how a lot of these end. Yeah. 
Jason, what does it mean to be an officer? I think an officer works for their airmen. I teach my cadets the, in capital A, airmen, right? Airmen, civilian, airmen, airmen, staff, sergeant, right? But you work for them. So if you are an officer leading 50 airmen and you have one boss, your real boss, the person or people that you are actually beholden to is those 50 airmen, right? Without them, leadership and by extension, officership means very little. So I would say everything that an officer does should be focused on their people, their unit's mission, and the broader Air Force, how they fit into that. And then, as I said a little bit earlier, take what you do very seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously, right? Because it's not about us. One day, all of us, as you have said many times on the show, will leave the Air Force and the Air Force will keep on Air Forcing. But our impact on the people should last longer. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Captain Jason Steed. It's been a pleasure to discuss the Office of Special Investigations, what it means to be a special agent, and now to have that reminder of what it means to be an officer, which is all-encompassing and all-important, even in the OSI career field. Thank you so much for the time. Anything else you want to leave the audience with before we jump off? No, again, thank you so much for folks listening to this podcast. You are already doing awesome things, you know, towards making yourself a better officer or better whatever you are. You're taking one step in the right direction, right? And further steps include reading professionally and other things, but anything you do to better yourself is not time wasted. So thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Awesome. Colin, what an interview. Thanks so much for bringing Jason on. I have to tell you, usually when we're doing commentary for interviews, I'm doing other things or I'm writing things down as I'm listening to it so I can prepare for our discussions. Not this time. I was learning the entire time. I know virtually nothing about this career field. It was fascinating. I learned a ton. Yeah. Tell us about it. What were some of the things that really stood out to you, like that were those huge aha moments for you about being a special investigator? Well, I think the thing that is most unclear to me is how people become special investigators. Mm -hmm. And I do want to point out that he didn't cover how people go through OTS, you know, how that is an accession source for them. Yeah. And I don't know that I ever had any students or even knew of students who were going into that career field. So that's still a big black hole for me. But just all I knew is that it wasn't exactly something you could just get. Yeah. You know, like, Colin, you civil engineer, you put in your preferences and it just showed up. Here's what you're going to do. I knew it was other. Yeah. <laughs> That's about all I had. So it was really awesome for me to hear how that works. It's not a career field I think many know about. It's not something when I'm talking with prior enlisted that they're thinking about doing. It's just not something I hear a lot of people talking about. So it was just so many gaps for me. The training that is, you know, all federal law enforcement agents have to go through. Yeah. I had no idea about that. I knew that they wore suits a lot. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Because like you, Colin, I have been fortunate to not have to deal with OSI very much. That's a good thing, in my opinion. Not because they're bad people, but because that means I've been able to avoid ugly things. Yeah. And I think we covered some of those things as well. I appreciated how he addressed how that can be a challenge and how the command is looking out for their, for their officers and their agents. And yeah. so, yeah, just the whole time filling in so many gaps for me, I really appreciated it. Yeah, absolutely. And let's call it like it is. You alluded to it that if you are interfacing with OSI on a regular basis, that's not exactly a good thing. I mean, these are amazing human beings that are willing to go into the depths of all of the terrible things that we do to each other as people, right? Yeah. And also the Office of Special Investigations for the Air Force is internal facing. They are policing us, right? It's different from what you talked about a few episodes ago with Zane Stedman about how Intel is external facing. But OSI, they're making sure that we, the blue suitors, are doing our job correctly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He talked about how their mission set is to focus on crime and counter intel and fraud. Like those are things that are happening inside the Air Force. Yeah. So again, if you are dealing with them, interfacing with them on a regular basis, that's not really a good thing, except I think we're doing ourselves a disservice as officers in general that we are trying to avoid 
interaction with these special investigators because by the time we get to being FGOs, especially taking the responsibility of squadron command, that's when we need them the most. Yeah. And we're just not ready for it. Yeah, there's the command school that squadron commanders will go through to prepare them for that. But honestly, I think that's too late. Yeah. By the time we get there, we should be much more familiar with how OSI works. We should be more familiar with JAGS and the UCMJ and all that stuff. But that's not the case right now. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I want to put a pin in that because I absolutely want to come back to that. But before we get to, you know, the UCMJ and the legal authorities and things, which I want to cover, I was just inspired by him. Absolutely inspired by him. Mm -hmm. How many times did he get kicked in the proverbial teeth and just decide, (laughs) hey, you know what? That's cool. I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to make awesome happen. Yeah. I mean, come on. Come on. It just happened over and over again. He had heart surgery. I know. And is still in the Air Force. Yeah. And after heart surgery, he's like, yeah, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to chip in. I'm on casual status, but I'm going to find things I can do. And I'm going to get a good recommendation so I can do this incredibly selective career field of OSI. Just, man, be that person. (laughs) Just be that person to everybody out there. No one would have judged Jason if he had said, you know, I just had heart surgery. I'm down, you know, how many times am I going to try to do the thing I want to do and the Air Force is going to tell me no. No one would have looked the other way if he would have been like, you know what, this just isn't for me. I'm going to go do something else. No one would have said anything. Mm -hmm. But he's like, no, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. And he got where he wanted to go. It's just incredibly inspiring. So bravo. And to everybody else listening, be that person. Be that person. Yeah. Well, and by be that person, you mean be self-aware enough to know what are the things that you should pursue and that you're truly capable of. Yeah. We're not saying that never give up on your dreams or on a particular thing. Like You can change your mind. You are allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So by be that person, we mean be self-aware and don't give up on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. And that's just completely inspiring. And makes me wonder if I'm putting in as much effort as I could be. Yeah. You know, when I hear folks who, how many truckloads of lemons did he get in his experience? (laughs) And yet he's just like, no, that's cool. I'm going to put my head down and work hard. It's just incredibly inspiring. Okay. So back to what I really do want to talk about. And I think this is going to lead to a broader conversation. And it's building off of what you were talking about, Colin, that we don't interact with OSI because as Jason mentions, 99.9% of everybody in the Air Force is a hardworking, good, honest patriot. Yeah. But we don't deal with that legal side enough because, you know, we don't have to. And we're doing ourselves a disservice. And we owe our audience a toolbox episode on the UCMJ. Mm -hmm. And something that, you know, you talked about and, and he brought up as well. And it made me reflect on my short 10 years in the Air Force. Colin, I've been the subject. I've been the witness and I've been an investigating officer in a command directed investigation. Yeah. And those were not things I was ready for. Those were not things I was even thinking about. Mm -hmm. I've read people, their article 31 rights, which to most of our audience may not sound familiar, but it's basically the Miranda rights. Think of law and order, the television show, right? You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's called the AFVA. 31 TAC 231. And it's a little card. I have it in my planner. I keep it with me at all times because you never know. Because now you know. Well, yeah, because now I know. And I don't think enough of us understand or fully appreciate. I know I don't, but there is a unique authority that we have as commissioned officers as a result of our commission Mm -hmm. under the UCMJ. And it will absolutely, without question, be a part of your career. And I don't think we talk enough about it. Yeah. I was a first lieutenant, brand new first lieutenant on a deployment when the commander pulled me into his office and said, hey, I need you to do a command-directed investigation. I'm like, what's that? Right. Well, I need you to interview such and such and people. You know, I'm giving you the vision. You go figure out how to do it. And I had to do exactly that. I don't remember the exact number of interviews that I did. It was not few. It was many. That included exactly that, reading people's rights and putting together a report with the help of OSI and JAG to 
make a recommendation to the commander on how to act with this information. I wasn't ready for that. But we're not just saying, like, to get someone in trouble. Like, commanders can put people in jail. Yeah. And that's the difference. And that's what happened. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I was dealing with in the CDI. It led to, like, actual, like, punishment. Yeah. And not just, like, you know, you're going to go sweep the floor now, but docked pay, redlining a stripe, incarceration behind bars. Yeah. The authority of the commission allows commanders to do that. It requires it. The UCMJ is essential, and we have not paid enough attention to it, Colin. We recognize this gap. It's something that we need to get to our audience. It's going to be a challenge to find the right person. So if you're listening and you're like, hey, I can help you, we're listening. You know how to yeah. reach us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com. We are listening. This is something we recognize we need to get more involved in and to bring to your audience because it will be a part of your Air Force officer career. And, you know, in Colin, when I was an instructor at OTS, and I know you did this at ROTC, when you go through those chapters on legal stuff, what is the like foot stomp, wave your hands in the air? thing that you want your students to learn go talk to ja go talk to ja right call that's them. the beginning that's the middle that's the end of the brief <laughs> and that's it that's all we teach them and i think that's a little inadequate now that i look back on my time and i'm like oh well i need a little bit more knowledge it's adequate in that it tells you where you should go for information yes but it doesn't prepare you for the things that you're going to do yeah when you find that you have to go do a cdi yeah, go talk to JA. Yes. Go talk to OSI. Yes. That should be step number one. But we don't emphasize enough that this is a real part of being an officer in the Air Force. Yeah, totally agree. And just in case anyone's confused, I'm going to stomp my feet and wave my hands in the air. If you ever have legal questions, go to JA. That's what they're for. And they're very good at their jobs. Yes. All right. Yeah, I needed to get that out. That was important to me. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Read. <laughs> My students would be ashamed if I didn't. How's that? Okay. So you mentioned, obviously, the importance of an episode on UCMJ. Wholly agree with that. There's another one that I think that we should do in a completely different direction, but still really important, is that of interviewing. We as officers don't interview or are not interviewed very much. Any assignments that we get, any jobs within the squadron, typically are just given to you. Yeah. And the same is true for your troops, the people that are assigned to your unit that you're going to have supervisor responsibility for. They're just given to you. You don't interview them for the different roles. That's all managed centrally, right? And so by the time we get to the end of our career, whether it's four years or 40, we don't generally have a very good skill set around being interviewed or interviewing other people. And so I think that now, we owe it to our audience to provide some information on how to interview and be on both sides of the interview. Yeah, I think that's fair. I would like to point out, and Colin, you and I discussed this very briefly, there are interview opportunities, and they're usually for the cool things. Sure, yeah. And so even if you are like, you know, the beginning of your career and you're locked in for the whole 20 years, you're like, I don't need to worry about interviewing. You may have an opportunity to do something really cool. They may expect an interview. Yeah, absolutely. And that could be, you know, a special assignment. That can be, you know, to go into, you know, one of those jobs that doesn't exist, doing something no one's ever going to talk about. I mean, those kinds of things often require interviews. And so, yes, no matter where you are, it's a skill. Reps are important. It's perishable. And, yeah, I think it's good to bring those hints, tips, and tricks to our audience. Yeah, I'm not saying that we don't interview in the Air Force, that it never happens. It's just that it's so rare that exactly as you're saying, we don't get those reps. The skills don't ever really blossom and come to fruition because they don't need to, right? Yeah, no, totally fair. So there's that. And then I have one other thing that I want to highlight out of this discussion with Jason that I thought was really important. And that is the idea of leading with or without rank. So to revisit that, as special investigators, whether officer, enlisted, or civilian, they don't wear a uniform. They wear a suit and tie. They're allowed to have beards. I hate them all. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Yeah. Just super jealous, right? Yeah. And that means that 
they know who is an officer who's enlisted, who's civilian, but they don't have the visual reinforcing that relationship on the regular basis yeah. like we do. We benefit as officers from wearing our rank there on our chest. Everybody can see it, right? We benefit from the enlisted having their rank on their chest, but that doesn't exist within OSI. And for good reason, he got into it during the interview that it's functionally important that they don't have rank. But the fact remains that you are still an officer. You still have to lead as an officer with that added benefit of the uniform being removed. And so it just makes it that much more challenging for you to rely on your connection with your people and having them know your competence and character in order to trust you because you don't have the rank staring them in the face. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. You know, we wear the rank. There's a functional reason in our community for that. Yeah. And it stems partly from tradition, but that tradition is born out of experience in that in the chaos of combat, in the fog and friction, there needs to be symbols to help you identify who's in charge, where to go, what you're doing. And so much of our tradition stems from those tools, yeah. right? The guide on, the flag, the colors, all these things, marching, the music, all that is born out of that experience. And I like, Colin, that you kind of brought out this idea, and I'll just kind of iterate on that. Do we rely on our rank that they can visibly see for our authority, or do we have it because of our connection, our competence, and our character? And I think that's an interesting question we can all ask ourselves, mm -hmm. is where are we? Yes, if you're walking down the street and you know, you're know you coming up on a group of airmen, they're going to look at you and they're going to see your rank, and then we all know how that works, right? Customs and courtesies, we salute, we say greeting of the day, we move on. But is there more to it than that? Is your bearing communicating something? Mm -hmm. Is your overall dress and appearance communicating something? You know, just something for us to kind of, you know, be introspective and ask ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to have the pendulum swing so far in the other direction that whenever you are not in uniform, people can be like, huh, that guy must be an officer. Yeah. No, I mean, that's just fair. look at him. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. But just as you're saying, the way that you carry yourself, the way that you speak, the way that you interact with others, is it worthy of your commission? It's a rhetorical question. I don't know. I can't say exactly what that looks like. But ask yourself, when you are not wearing the rank, are you still an officer? I would hope the answer is yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. And what does that look like? Yeah, really good. I'm glad you brought that up. And even when they are in uniform, their name tape says special agent. Yeah. So they don't even have that. You know, it's really interesting stuff. Really great interview with Jason. I'm really glad he was able to join. I told you already, he filled in so many gaps for me. And I hope that it did for you, our audience as well. Really glad we were able to connect Captain Jason Steed with our audience. Anything else, Colin, before we wrap up today? The last thing that I want to say is I hope that this makes OSI, those professionals that are the special agents, the special investigators, makes them human to you and makes you more willing to work with them, cooperate with them, and maybe want to be one, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think if we've done that, we've achieved our goal here today. Yeah, totally agree. And with that, this will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed.